It is 10.01. Good morning. I'm Lucas Panzica from the 104.5 The Zone Studios and NFL free agency news. Former Titans and Ravens pass rusher Jadavian Clowney has signed with the Carolina Panthers on a two-year deal worth $20 million up to $24 million. It's the sixth NFL team in the career of the 31-year-old South Carolina native. College basketball Vanderbilt is set to officially introduce new men's basketball coach Mark Byington. In a press conference today at 4 p.m., Byington went 82-36 and 36 in four years as the head coach at James Madison, including a first-round NCAA tournament win last weekend over Wisconsin. The Sweet 16 begins tonight with Clemson and Arizona in the West region. That's at 6-10. San Diego State takes on top-seeded UConn at 6-40, a national championship rematch from last year. And Alabama faces one-seed UNC in L.A., at 8.40, the night will wrap up with Illinois taking on Iowa State for a 9-10 tip-off. You can hear all the Westwood One coverage right here on The Zone. For your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and Vols. This is 104.5 The Zone. I'm greeted this morning by the YouTube comments section. You can stream the radio show, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Twitch. Eric Taylor, Lucas, demanding of us right off the top. I demand baseball talk today or else. Threats is what we're greeted with. Who wants to tell him? Might have bad news for Eric Taylor. (laughs) Oh, no. Got nothing for you, bud. Sorry, buddy. Jadavion Clowney, though, I got some contract details for you there. If you want to discuss, 615-737-1045 is the number. I did uh, hold a shiv to Lucas's side this morning and demand to talk about Shohei Otani so I can get a little baseball adjacent for you, though that's more to do with scandal and gambling and lying and all sorts of fun stuff that yeah, I I'd go with that. You don't have to threaten me to talk about Shohei. That is a wild Wild situation, but nothing to do with actual baseball. No, nothing to do with actual baseball. Happy opening day to those of you who celebrate. I'm sure Will Bowling worked it in throughout the course of the morning today. Uh, but we do have some free agency stuff, and we're going to talk about where Legereus Sneed can help the Titans the most for this team that's looking in a lot better shape than when I left uh, left the office on Thursday afternoon to start my vacation, came back. It's a different-looking team. Now, one player does not change everything, and certainly they still have work to do, but you feel pretty good about where the roster is, given where the roster was not three months ago. Uh, Titans legend Jadavion Clowney did get a deal, as Lucas mentioned in his update. Bert and I were talking about this last night because, of course, he is most recently of Robert Walsh's Ratbirds. Had a really nice season for Baltimore. Uh, Nine and a half sacks, two forced fumbles. He was very, very active, and he was very available, which is not something that you can typically say about Jadavion Clowney, certainly not during his time here. It was one of his best seasons of his career. I would argue it's the best season of his career. I mean, he goes back home. The last time that he... He's never had more than nine and a half sacks. The last time he had nine and a half sacks was in like 2016, 2017. Houston. When he was with the Texans. That's as promising as Jadavion Clowney has ever looked. And he played a bunch of games and it looked weird because he wore number 24, but you're not here for that. I never got over that. It was, it was, I, that's the one of the numbers things that drives me crazy, Lucas. I know nobody else cares. College football people are used to this, but Jadavion Clowney wearing 24 threw me for a loop every time last year. Anyway. Yeah, that that was weird. What was he was ninety with the Titans, right? Uh oh, God, what was his number with the Titans? I think it was ninety. It's gonna be such a, a just such a weird experience, the Jadavian Clowney thing here, with how badly people wanted him. Remember, it was Clowney Watch 
the entire lead up to him finally getting signed. Oh my and, God. It was going to be the difference between them winning the Super Bowl that year. And it, I won't say it could not have gone worse because <laughs> Vic Beasley came in at the same time and that was much worse, but it was about as bad as you could have imagined in terms of availability and lack of production. Clowney's time here is softened by the fact that he came in at the same time as John Robinson lit. What was what was it? Nine million dollars on fire and handed it to Vic Beasley just to watch it evaporate into the air. He met, but he he had to give back like a hundred grand right out of the gate because he was ten days late to training camp. You remember all that nonsense? That is what a time. One of the most underrated uh, John Robinson swing and misses. <laughs> like we talk a lot about draft misses. I don't know. We talk plenty about Vic Beasley. I mean, Vic Beasley's up there with Isaiah Wilson. It re- it really is. Just as far as how big of a miss it was, you can argue that. Losing out on a first round pick is a lot more has a lot more of an impact. But as far as just a swing and a miss, Vic Beasley and Isaiah Wilson are shaking hands. Uh, well, and it just so happens that they came to Tennessee in the same offseason. Impeccable timing. <laughs> Not to kick you while you're down, John, but oh, brother. <laughs> What happened there? The COVID year, tough times. But that's not that's not our point. Jadavion Clowney got another job and got a contract with the Carolina Panthers. So apparently, you know, he's from South Carolina. We all know this. He's He wants to be close to home. He's bounced around. He's made plenty of money throughout the course of his career. And the Panthers are in a position to pay him. And expectations are going to be low in, in Carolina next year. So Jadavion Clowney can do what Jadavion Clowney does best, which is not necessarily rush the passer, but kind of coast. And do so for two years, 20 mil. He got Danico Autry's contract. Yep. This is something that we're going to talk about a little later on because the Titans still do have tons of needs up front. It's It really can't just be Joseph Day, who we haven't really gotten into much, or at least Joseph. I haven't. Joseph. That's what I said. You said Joseph Day. Sebastian Joseph Day. It's Sebastian Joseph now. No, it's not. Yes, it is. That's what we were told. No, I got a correction in a text message afterwards. Back off. What? Yes. The email said he prefers to go by Sebastian Joseph. Eat it. You're not good enough to get the emails and the text messages because there was a text (laughs) message clarifying. All right, back off me. What are we snip snapping for? Don't don't ask me. I don't know. I, I can go back and find it. It was a whole. Uh, it was a whole to do. Every every member of Titans Media except for Lucas was copied on this text message. <laughs> <laughs> I'll clarify for you a little later. Perhaps there's some context in there that I've forgotten. Um, yes. So, okay, never mind. We don't have to read that on the air. Just know it's Sebastian Joseph Day, and that's from that's from the top. All right. Snip snap. <laughs> but I think that the uh, I think that. The thing that concerns me is the depth up front continuously. The corner help goes so far, and you saw Jeff Simmons tweeting about how excited he was to have this kind of secondary behind him. Still have a lot to add up front, and Clowney, the money, two years 20, man. Up to 24. I guess that's about right for the season that he had. He deserved to get paid. I'm just curious to see... What makes the most sense? Have you thought at all about defensive players in the draft? Like, really? Because we've spent so much time talking about tackle, and for good reason. There is still need at tackle. There is still need at wide receiver. There is still need all over the place. But how much have you really given, you know, a percentage of your brain to thinking about a defensive player in the first round and the idea of trading out of seven to potentially add not just a tackle, but also a defensive player, because I'm talking about an inside linebacker, I'm talking about an edge rusher, I'm talking about an interior defensive lineman, somebody, anybody, say something, right? Well, it seems like the intention was to add an off-ball linebacker in free agency. Rand Carthon straight up said they wanted to bring back Aziz Alshayer. They were in for Jerome Baker. They couldn't get either of those done. So how do they adjust from there? How do they have to pivot to address that need? And does it turn into more of a draft need than maybe previously anticipated? So why don't we talk about that with some free agent stragglers and see who makes the most sense for the Titans to add. We'd be happy to take your participation. Who are you most interested in seeing this team pursue now that the, uh, now that we've made it through the first couple of waves of free agency with still a ton of players out there, still some teams Um, that have a ton of shopping to do because you mentioned, Lucas, 
that Bill Barnwell of ESPN.com put together one of these famous off-season lists. We're in full-on list season at this point. Listing how many teams that still had significant roster holes after the first couple of waves of free agency. The article was... Barnwell, which NFL teams still have roster holes after free agency? Nine that need reinforcements. The Titans are not one of the ones listed. Now, they're all big market teams, right? It's Denver, it's Chargers, Cowboys, Falcons, Giants. But the Titans are not part of the nine for Bill Barnwell. Do you think that's because the Titans no longer have roster needs or because the Titans being on a list of nine, you know, they weren't, they didn't make the cut? Because I got I got Nick Wright out here on Fox saying that they're they're poorly run. Did you see that clip making the rounds? No, talking uh, about the Titans. Oh yeah, had plenty of Titans fans. He said they were competing for the number one overall pick. This is Chiefs wow. fan Nick Wright who gave Ladarius Sneed a, a Ladarius Sneed a very uh, warm goodbye on the way out the door on Twitter. I saw that and then went on television promptly the next day. Said the Titans are competing for the first <laughs> overall pick and that they're poorly run. What's his evidence? <laughs> Nothing. It's just you, there's no accountability in media. We can just say things. That's the fun part. <laughs> they had a very a lot of butthurt Titans fans send me that yesterday. Listen, guys, here's the thing. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. If you are talking about this particular franchise on a national platform, what is the best way to engage you? Is it to tell you about how much, how great the Titans are and how well they've done and letting go of Mike Vrabel and moving on and all those things, or is it to take a swing at you and try and piss you off on the internet to try and get some engagement out of you? Because I want to tell you, it might just be the latter. It might just be. It's okay. There's, it's uh, Nick Wright, he's not, he's not just a dope on television. It's a little formulaic. We'll leave you with that. Free agent stragglers. Lucas is going to throw a bunch of names at me. We'll talk about them next.
Welcome back on this Thursday morning. We are happy to have you here with Lucas and myself. Unless you're Nick Wright, chat doesn't seem to be receiving him well on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Twitch. What are you eating? <laughs> I know it's bad when he has to wave me off. Whatever it is, it's probably dry. That's professional. A uh, lot of praise pouring in for Chiefs homer Nick Wright on his comments that the Titans are a poorly run organization. Isn't that what every fan base wants, though? Like some kind of national representation out there that capes up for your team from time to time? I don't know. I mean, I guess McCourty is it now, right, on Good Morning Football? I I don't know what people associate him with most, but I would imagine it's the Titans. It's either him or Clay Thompson, right? That's about the list. Either way. 615-737-1045. I'm eating tacos. It's 1021 in the morning. What kind of tacos are you eating? Breakfast tacos. Ramon got a bunch from Lady Bird. Sitting in the production room if you want it. I know. I can still hear him in your jowls. <laughs> <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't think the seven-minute commercial break? The start of the seven-minute commercial break that we have was the time to eat the tacos. It was a race against time, and I lost. <laughs> Excellent work by you. Uh, Lucas is going to throw a bunch of free agent names at me. We're going to talk about the viability for them for the Titans. We'll take some phone calls first. A quick reminder, if you have not got your tickets, because I got a notification that we sold 10 more yesterday for the install live show. They're going very quickly. Friday, May the 3rd. You can be in the house when Greg Cosell of NFL Films and myself break down the entire Titans free agent class, including LeJarius Sneed, and the upcoming draft class six days after the draft concludes. We've got special guests planned. We're going to tell you about those closer to the event date. But now is the time to get in for those $25 tickets because they're going very, very quickly at 1045thezone.com. It's just 25 bucks to get in the door. And if you want the VIP package with priority seating, with dinner beforehand, and with drink tickets included, it's only 75 bucks. Sold how many yesterday? Ten. And we're very happy with that. I don't have to eat a hot chip and poison myself on the air to sell tickets this year. It's very Shame. exciting for me. Shame. <laughs> I mean, we can still think of something dumb. We just have to clear it through an army of lawyers that wanted to kill us after the last hot chip thing. Mistake. Andrew is calling us from Oxford. Hey, Andrew. Buck, how you doing? Good. So, first of all, I want to comment on the Nick Wright thing. I know you're tired of talking about it, but I think he's mad because we traded for the best defensive player outside of Chris Jones for a pack of big league shoes. So I think that's why he's a little bit mad. But, um... I, I just wanted to ask the age-old question, if Alt or Neighbors are on the board at seven, who do you pick? I like Neighbors just because we'll have no wider years outside of Ridley after this year, presuming Hopkins walks away. So I'll listen. Thank you so much. So the timeless debate, is this our Jamar Chase, Panay Sewell? Sure. Different, but sure. It's for sure different. Both Chase and Sewell, I think, were regarded as better prospects than neighbors and alt, though they are very good players. Let's make sure we're clear on that. But this is as close a, an approximation as we'll have. Both at or very near the top of their respective class. So, what would I do? Well, Andrew's still there. What would I do or what do I think they're going to do, Andrew? Well, what what do you think they'll do? Because I think they'll probably pick Alt just because we can't have Will Levis turn into a pancake every play. Mm. So, I mean, we have to have somebody protect him. But neighbors would be exciting. That would get – I mean, th who do you have to guard those three receivers and Ridley, Hawkins, and neighbors? I mean, that's a tough task for any defensive coordinator to come up with. So, th that's, that would be my choice. But I think they'll probably go with Alt just because it's a safer pick. He'll be there – left tackle for the next 10 years if everything goes right. Okay. So, I'll preface this as we always should by saying I have no, in this exercise, I have no idea who's on the draft board around them, who's already gone versus who's left to, to play, but we're, we're just focusing on neighbors versus alt if they're both there at seven. I think that they would be inclined to take the receiver. 
and not just because that's been a lot of the discussion about, you know, players that score touchdowns and how much better some people think Malik Neighbors might be. Lucas, do you agree with the premise? Because I know we went back and forth on this, what was that, Thursday or Wednesday before I left, the idea that some people, Dane Brugler of The Athletic and Daniel Jeremiah of the NFL Network, two of the top draft analysts that we have, were out there on social media saying that they were being told by organizations that some organizations might think of Malik Neighbors as a better pro prospect as Marvin Harrison Jr. And we we walked through the idea that coaches get to the scouting process late. They're not specifying who they're talking to within the organization. So if a coach says that, it's much less surprising than if a, a scout says that or a GM says that. But also, do you agree with the premise that neighbors might have a higher ceiling or Odunze might have a higher ceiling than Marvin Harrison Jr. Marvin Harrison Jr. is just the most pro-ready prospect right now. Do you yes. accept that premise? Yes, but we could do this at the top of every class, we right? Could, we might have a higher ceiling. But I'm, I'm doing it with this class. Do you accept that as the premise? I, I can accept that. I don't know about Adunze. I'm, I'm iffy on Roma Dunze for whatever. I like Malik Neighbors a lot. I think Marvin Harrison Jr. is the best receiver in this class. I will be very surprised if Marvin Harrison Jr. is not the first receiver off the board. Well, we'll wait to see. Long, long way of answering the question. I think that they would take Neighbors over Alt if he's there. Now, that's just an educated guess. I have no idea. I think that that would also be my preference. If they're going to stay, if it's a tackle at all, I'm good with trading out. I, I think you can find him. I think you can make it work. I, I think if if you don't have the guy that you consider to be blue chip, like we were assuming that just because a, a player is picked in the top 10, that they would be considered blue chip caliber by the organizations that are taking them. And that might be so. But if for whatever reason that neighbors or alt isn't considered a blue chip prospect to them, I'm completely fine with them trading out and addressing more needs and trying to put together a, a rookie class that looks kind of like the Lions last year. The Lions, did the Lions have need, like desperate need at running back and inside linebacker in the first round last year? Not necessarily. Those picks worked out within the premise of their draft class and they didn't they weren't necessarily like the best performing rookies out of their draft class. Laporta was probably the best rookie out of the Lions draft class last year, but just trying to stack needs all over the place to put together baseline competency on both sides of the ball cuz they need baseline competency on both sides of the ball. You're trying to build build up to the point where you have the Avengers and right now you're just at the point where you've added a you've added a, a uh, a Robin to Jeff Simmons Batman, right? In Legarius Need or however you wanna however you wanna pivot them, I guess, or present them. You've just added a second guy. That's really the uh, Harold might be in that discussion, but I don't think anybody's talking about Harold Landry as as arguably the best player at his position, the way that Jeff and Sneed you could make the case for. Are you saying if it's neighbors versus all and I, I know you're saying that's what you think they would do if mm -hmm. it's neighbors versus alt straight up. Are you saying that's what you think they should do? Neighbors versus alt at seven. Straight up one or the neighbors, other. Neighbors, yeah. I you would, you've been on left tackle this whole time at seven. I don't think I this is the first time I've heard you deviate from that. I just think the more that I listen to smarter people than me talk about the offensive line talent and have the opportunity to work through these guys individually with Greg and then take the notes that Greg gives me and go back and watch them for myself. Like, I'm not pretending to be any kind of top-flight sure. offensive line analyst. But you are changing your opinion on what you think they would do at seven if Neighbors is on the board. No, I think I've been pretty consistent. I feel like every time we've talked about this, you have been on for them? a tackle. No, yes. no, no. For for me. For you. Yes. For you. I'm, I'm talking saying, about your opinion, not what you you're think. You're correct. This is the first time that I've really deviated from the tackle situation. I just feel a little better about it as we've gone on gone along. Depend I mean, you use the term blue chip. How much of a blue chip left tackle? How much does Bill Callahan believe that Joe Alt is? Yeah, that's a guy that I 
He might. That guy will be an all-pro. All right, listen, I can't get in the man's head. Give me that guy for a decade. Sure. If Bill Callahan is convicted about Joe Alt. Is Bill Callahan coaching for a decade? Oh, yeah, probably not. I don't know. But you get what I'm saying. Yeah. If he is convicted on Joe Alt, I bet they take Joe Alt at seven. The question with trading back is, do you want to address more needs with two to three good players that can help you? Or do you want the guy that you believe can be an all-pro cornerstone piece for this roster for the years to well, come. Well, let me make let me make myself clear. I think they should trade out of seven. Like, no matter what. No matter what. Well, not no matter what, but you know what I'm saying. I just... I, I, I think that the best possible move on the board here, given the quarterback-thirsty teams in Minnesota and in Vegas, I think that the best possible solution for me personally, Lucas, is trading out of seven and picking up additional first-round picks or a, you know, in some form or fashion, recouping the third-round pick because they have needs everywhere. I, I still need to hear a good solution for your left tackle outside of just taking the best one at seven. Give me one, please. You take one at 13 and and pick up the, well, what's Minnesota? Minnesota's 11 and 23? Yes. So Minnesota is 11 and 23. You take the tackle at 11. You take an inside line. You take Junior Colson at 23. I know Titans fans aren't going to love the idea of an inside linebacker in the first round, and he may not be there at 23. But you're saying doing a trade with Minnesota to acquire their two first round picks? If you're moving up in if you're moving up into the quarterback draft, I don't think it's feasible. I don't think it's unfeasible to ask for two first round picks. Yeah, but Minnesota, if they're going to move up, don't they? I feel like it's going to be an arms race to get into that top four. Sure, that's and where teams are going to be. That. Like, who do you get at seven? To move up in the quarterback draft. Is Minnesota going to be willing to give up both their first round picks to get to seven if they're going to miss out on J.J. McCarthy with all the buzz he's getting? Does or Washington May? Take, yeah, that's the thing. Does Washington take McCarthy at two and send this whole thing right down the toilet? That's what it will send it into a frenzy. McCarthy I can't, goes I at two. I hope something like oh, that absolutely. happens. That feels like the most chaotic potential piece of this draft. The idea of maybe Drake May being available at four. Then think about what the car. I mean, Cardinals are trading back, right? Monty mm. Austin Fort. I, I yes. mean, Give are me they? All, it, it, like, if Monty Austin Fort is sitting there with Drake May on the board at four, he's getting calls from the Broncos, from the Vikings, from the Raiders. I mean, Monty Austin Fort has options at that point. We have overcomplicated and- Andrew's question so much. So much. <laughs> neighbors are all at seven. I, I think that they would take neighbors. I am also in favor of them taking neighbors. I want the left tackle. I understand. Just fix it. <laughs> Just fix it. Lucas, they can. I promise you they can. If you what is what does Slay call Callahan? O line Jesus. O L J. Yep. O line Jesus. If you are a true believer, all right, we're gonna put your faith to the test here. If you are a true believer in O line Jesus, as we get uh get ready to come up on a very uh religious, uh, religiously tinged weekend, all right? Then you can you can let go of that white knuckle grip that you've got around a tackle at seventh overall, and maybe take him at thirteen, or maybe take him at eleven, depending on the teams that are willing to trade up for your first round pick. I know that's not comfortable for you. I can see the fear. I can. It's it's a different form of BVS. I mean, BTS is entirely predicated around the Titans' offensive line situation. BTS is a Korean pop band. It's also something that plagues Titans fans deeply. <laughs> and it might be the Korean pop band. Who's to say? Uh, oh, my on? Jesus, save us. <laughs> Wait, can we replace, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus from Caleb Farley. Do you have him handy? Yeah, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. It, can we rebuke things in the name of O-line Jesus? Do you think he'd ever recut the line for us? Probably not. Probably not. Probably not at this point. Titans PR is listening to this say, well, they're never getting Bill Callahan. Yeah. (laughs) I'm just trying to start a cult for your offensive line coach. I don't see what the big deal is. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Because I, I really do think that there's enough tackle depth in this class with the best offensive line coach going right now. And I know Munchak's back in the game, but still, Callahan is regarded as the best, if not if not the best, one of the best offensive line coaches, I, I think it's okay for me to have a little faith. But I keep coming back to what Brian Callahan said 
at the Combine when he was asked about something in that vein, about the idea of maybe being more willing to go deeper in the draft because of what you have in your offensive line coach and Bill Callahan. And he said, when elite coaching meets elite talent, something special happens. And I keep coming back to that quote when thinking about the left tackle position of the Titans. No, that was your whole justification for taking Bowers. Even you have flip-flopped. What? What was my justification? You want elite talent and elite coaching. Well, yeah, I do think Brock Bowers is an elite, potentially game-changing talent. You were in on Bowers. What happened? I was. What What scared you? I'd be okay with taking Brock Bowers at seven. More than more than the wide receiver? I'd be okay with taking Brock Bowers at seven more than I would in Elite Neighbors at seven because of what the Titans have done at receiver in the offseason mm. and the ability to add a receiver in the second round or even in the fourth round on day three. I, I think Brock Bowers is going to be elite. Truly, I think Brock Bowers can have a Travis Kelsey impact in his career. I, I've I've watched too much Brock Bowers over the last three years. I've watched the tape. I truly damn it. believe it. I've 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 broke it down. <laughs> I've been I've been in the cave. <laughs> just just the one. This is the first prospect deep dive Lucas has ever done on Brock Bowers. I mean, hell, I tried to draft him when he was a true freshman. Lucas had to tell me the first year we were on the air. No, you idiot. He can't come out yet. Goodness. Uh, we'll take more of your phone calls coming up next. 615-737-1045 if you got them. Uh, it is opening day in baseball. The only way to get us to talk about baseball is through scandal. And the MLB has a massive one to start its year right off the top. I didn't get around to it last week. We're going to talk about Shohei Otani coming up next.
All right, we're going to get to some baseball stuff on opening day here in just a minute. Take some phone calls first. 615-737-1045 is the number. Let's start with Chuck in Clarksville. Hey, hey, Lucas and uh, Buck. Hey, um, I don't. I, I think Brock Byers is the top choice. I mean, I just think he's. You can put him outside, either outside spots. You can put him on the tight end spots. You can put him in the slot. You can put him in the backfield. He can run on short yardage situations. You can put him on on the end the round runs. I mean, this guy is to me is a generational tight end that you haven't seen in a while. I mean, he's like Shan- if you took pieces from if you're a mad scientist and took pieces from Shannon Sharp, Travis Kelsey, and and uh, Gronk and put them all into one. That's what this guy to me is. So I, I think he has to be the pick at seven because you're not going to get Marvin Harrison. And you know, if you look at all the draft boards, the top three picks, Byers is either three to five. So I would take Bowers, and then like I said the, the tackle class this year is at least ten deep, so we can get a, a good, a very good tackle. Maybe not all size, but we can get a very good tackle at, at uh, the second round pick at thirty eight. Thank you for the call, Chuck. Right at a minute. Me and Lucas are sitting there bickering about when we should play the music. Yeah, you were premature. You wanted it at like fifty two. I want the music to start at forty five. Forty five. My goodness. I think that's fair. Starts at one minute on the dot. Okay. They're showing a surprise Titans onside kick from 2016 on NFL Network right now. Who's the opponent? Packers. It says... Oh, is this the game at Nissan Stadium? The I guess it was the game the Titans blew out the Packers yeah. at home. Yeah, It's number five in their top five worst surprise onside kicks of all time. <laughs> <laughs> surprise, not really. <laughs> uh, but Chuck, a big Brock Bowers believer. He's Bowers is like the biggest. I don't know how how would you describe him? I would describe him as like the biggest name that's got a question mark by him. Like I think McCarthy is another one of these for different reasons, but Bowers is a high level prospect. We all know he's one of the best players in the draft, but there's still a little bit of a question mark because is he built like a a tight end, like a prototypical tight end. How much does that matter? Do you have to make exceptions for him is what I would be asking Is it, if I'm an NFL talent evaluator or is he the exception, right? How much of your offense do you have to change because you've got a, a six three, six foot three tight end who may not be the best inline blocker, has some ability, has the ability to be an X you know, split out skill position player and can win one-on-one, has the movement skills, has the speed, even though he's not, I mean, he's not been doing the testing or anything like that with the pro days and the combine, but still, you know what kind of play speed he has because the the film is what you're ultimately going to default to here. But he seems like the biggest kind of, I don't know, question mark of all of the top players in this draft class, because McCarthy is is a different kind of category of this, but I think of them in the same light. I mean, when you say question mark, do you mean like wild card as far as where he could go? Yeah, maybe that's a better maybe that's a better way. Mark makes it sound like yeah, I don't know about this guy. Be- no, I we definitely know he's a good player, but I don't, I don't, is he a good player for everybody? I, I don't that's think what I'm saying. To, I don't think you need to change your offense for Brock Bowers. That's the beauty of what Brock Bowers does. I think he can fit into your offense and do a bunch of different things. He can cater to your offense, not the other way around. And he's not a pro. And that's the hope. Yeah, that's 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 why it's not just tight end at seven. What do you do? like? That's a lazy way to look at it. He's not your prototypical tight end. It's a good thing for Brock Bowers. <laughs> Somebody just said Brock Bowers is the Caucasian Delaney Walker because of the way that he's able to uh, because he's able to be so versatile. Delaney, that was a big part of Delaney Walker's appeal. And Delaney's not the. I mean, Delaney's a big dude. Like, I mean, he's still built like he could bleep somebody up no delaney was like a specialist in san francisco he's a fullback yeah Yeah, 46 so delaney walker is a is a great example of the kind of versatility that a player like that can bring and i don't hate the comparison but i mean delaney is significantly more solid than brock bowers is like you can do a lot more creative stuff and stuff behind the line of scrimmage with delaney walker because he's built like a like a tank 
Philip in Nashville's next. Hey, Philip. Uh, when you get a chance, you need to call Chuck back and tell him uh, I'm in 100% agreement with him. If Bowers is there at seven, take Bowers. And here's my here's my reasoning. So here's my justification. Go back 15, 20 years. Look at every Super Bowl contender. What was one of their one key ace in the holes that they had across the middle? And it's been tied in. It's been the tight end position. Now, would that mean Tennessee's going to have to change a bunch of stuff up? They're doing it now. So why not continue to change stuff up? You you eliminate that need. Uh, let me rephrase that. You eliminate the higher need for that left tackle because you're going to have less pressure coming in because now you've got to deal with three elite receivers coming in, and then you put a somewhat nobody knows anything about him, what he can do, but Bowers is a really good, he's got great hands. you got to give him that. Of all the questionables and variables we've talked about, he's got great hands and he can get open. And when you put that variable across five, five yards, three or five yards across the offensive line, right across the middle, you take the linebackers out of the equation and you take a lineman out of the equation. Now you've got two running backs in the back. You don't have Derrick Henry anymore, so you know you're not running the ball on every damn play. And then you've got that ace in the hole, just like every Super Bowl contender's had in the last 10 to 15 years. And that's my argument for Bowers. You waited until like a minute 25 that time. Yeah, I forgot. <laughs> Thank you for the call, Philip. Hmm. It's an interesting discussion. I mean, the, all, that's all this, the draft, that's what we're going to do for the next month is draft hypotheticals, aren't we? I saw on the FNM Bank chat, and I've, I've lost it. Somebody saying, if the Chargers take Alt, take Bowers. Mm. If Joe Alt is off the board, take Brock Bowers. It's possible that he comes off the board before seven. It's uh, everybody, everybody ahead of you. All the needs are offensive, and there's only so many quarterbacks that are going to go before seven. So it's 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 a it's an interesting kind of math equation that they've got to work through. It was Benny Boy on Twitch in the FNM Bank chat who said that. Okay, Thank Jim you. Harbaugh had some comments on Joe Alt. Did he? Yeah, Harbaugh Harbaugh's been been interesting in this draft process with the stuff on JJ McCarthy. And the talk about Joe Alt, I mean, he he's talked about it as though I got. I'll, I'll track down the quote. I'll track down the quote. His you are really trying to fight me, fight against me doing any kind of baseball related stuff today, aren't talk you? Talk about Shohei. Okay. This Shohei Otani thing. I know I'm a little late, but I was out last week when it broke. He had so the translator, Mizuhara, is the last name. Fired last week accused on Monday by Shohei Otani of stealing $4.5 million from Otani to pay off Mizuhara's gambling debts to a sports bookie now currently under federal investigation in a situation where Otani had initially said that he had given him the money to pay off the gambling debts, which would mean that he knew previously about the gambling debts, the idea that a translate... What's the most ridiculous part of the story to you? Mm. Because the idea that a translator has access to four and a half million dollars... <laughs> yeah. And it's just... Bank it, account. It just run, well, much less, who the hell is giving a, a, a translate? Like, what can a translator possibly make? I have no idea. I, maybe more for Shohei Otani because he's an economy unto himself. But, like, top end, a translator make $500,000? That's significant amount of money who the hell is letting a, a translator hypothetically making half a million dollars a year who's giving them a four and a half million dollar line of credit yeah i mean it's a it's a valuable job because shohei otani is the face of baseball he is the sport's m biggest star and this is the person tasked with communicating what shohei is saying to the rest of the non-japanese speaking world and the japanese speaking world is going to be hyper focused on everything that the translator is saying or everything that shohei is saying while the translator right. is redis redistributing it for lack of a better term I, I don't know how the hell this this doesn't just nuke him i mean you're talking about 
you're talking about a federal investigation now. Not just MLB uh, screwing around and trying to come up with some multi-game suspension for gambling infractions and stuff like that. This is like, you see this basketball player the other day, and I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but somebody was making $20,000 bets. John Tay Porter. John Tay Porter. Yeah, Michael Porter's brother. Right, who nobody knew existed until this gambling scandal. John Tay Porter, people are betting John Tay Porter unders, but they're betting like $20,000 a pop on John Tay Porter unders and stuff like that, cashing in huge amounts of money. And John Tay Porter is now having to answer questions about it because, of course, you're going to be implicated in in the middle of all that. That's such a smaller microcosm of what this potentially could be because he is the most – there's nothing more marketable in baseball than Shohei Otani. Porter was a blue-chip, five-star recruit who played with Michael at Mizzou. I remember them well from their playing days under Conzo Martin. That's also a wild story in the NBA. What? The Jonte Porter. Oh, yeah. No, it's it's a mess with the gambling stuff around sports. I just don't know how. Like, it's like the, he didn't take questions, Shohei Otani. And he clearly wasn't prepared for people to follow up on his initial statement because they've handled everything in the aftermath of that so poorly to where he immediately looks guilty as soon as you start to walk some of this stuff back. It's a bad look, however you shake it, right? There is no way that he's not implicated in this in some form or fashion. Lucas, even if even if he did change his story to say that, yes, I gave him the money to repay his gambling debts, then that means you knew that he was gambling at a previous date and didn't do anything about it until it was discovered by, uh, I think the Los Angeles Times is the one doing the bulk of the reporting on this. See, we did baseball on opening day. Name one matchup today. Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> name one. I I could barely name you 30 teams. <laughs> Are you kidding me? No. We should do that this summer. Just Naming like, baseball? No. Do you want to lose teams? the entire baseball audience? How many teams? They already suffer through us not knowing anything about their sport very, very patiently. The, the, I don't want to spit in their faces by not being able to name all 30 MLB clubs. Uh, all you need to know is Braves are not playing today. Game got postponed due to weather. Oh, really? Against the Phillies. I'm sorry for Will. All right. J.J. McCarthy's draft stock. How real is the spike that we're seeing in the conversation around him? We'll talk about it next.
It is 1101. Good morning. I'm Lucas Panzeca from the 1045 The Zone Studios. In NFL free agency news this morning, former Titans and Ravens pass rusher Jadavian Clowney has signed with the Carolina Panthers on a two-year deal worth $20 million, up to $24 million. It is the sixth NFL team in the career of the 31-year-old South Carolina native. College basketball, Vanderbilt set to officially introduce new men's basketball coach Mark Byington in a press conference today at 4 p.m. Byington went 82-36 and 36 in four years as the head coach at James Madison, including a first-round NCAA tournament win last weekend over Wisconsin. The Sweet 16 starts tonight. Clemson and Arizona in the West at 610. San Diego State takes on top-seeded UConn. That's at 640. And Alabama faces one seed UNC in L.A. at 840. The night wraps up with Illinois taking on Iowa State, a 9-10 tip-off. You can hear all the Westwood One coverage right here on The Zone. For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and Vols. This is 104.5 The Zone. What's happening? Second hour underway. We're happy to have you. 615-737-1045, the number. We'll get to your phone calls here in just a second. And we've got some people curious about the draft. So let's talk a little draft. Smokescreen or not is the question. J.J. McCarthy and the amount of momentum that he's gaining as a top prospect, not just a top prospect, a potential top five pick in the upcoming NFL draft. The Michigan quarterback whose film sample size is small because despite him having been at Michigan for an extended period of time, they don't ask him to throw the ball very often. The vast majority of Michigan's offense is based around their running game. J.J. McCarthy executes that well. When he's asked to deliver throws on times and uh, on time and with accuracy and within structure and on schedule, he seems to do that well. But again, how, how, what his ceiling is, how good of a prospect, how pro-ready he actually is, there's still a fair amount of debate. Now, I can't imagine a world in which J.J. McCarthy is a top five pick. But apparently, while I was out on vacation, Lucas, Tom Pelissero said when? From the owners' meetings? that that was very much within the realm of possibility, a top five pick, and not just a top five pick, but potentially top two. Really interesting because everybody's always trying to figure out, especially at the top of the graph, what the other teams are doing. When I've had conversations here with executives for other teams who know Adam Peters well, know the situation well, the most popular answer for what they do at number two is J.J. McCarthy. Whoa. Now, yes, it, this made the waves. I'm surprised you did not see this. I was among the waves. Not actually. I didn't get in the ocean. It's very cold. Very dangerous for you. <laughs> I mean, I did the hot tub. Uh, we talked about this on Tuesday with Rhett, and Rhett was not surprised by it with how good of a combine performance J.J. McCarthy had. Two? I was I was surprised. Yeah, two, I was very surprised by it, and it reeks of the Mac Jones discussion which also involved Adam Peters when he was with the 49ers mm -hmm. front office about, oh, the Niners are trading into the top three for Mac Jones, and they did trade into the top three, but for Trey Lance. And Jones ended up going almost exactly where we thought he would. Now, at the time, we thought it was ridiculous because Trey Lance was thought of as a better prospect, not a better college quarterback, but a better pro prospect than was Mac Jones. In retrospect, and I understand that Trey Lance had significant injury that derailed him very, very much, but in retrospect, Mac Jones was probably the better pro prospect. Probably should have been over the guy who played one game in college. We got caught up, understandably, in the athletic traits. NFL teams clearly did the same. I don't know how, how different... Trey Lance's situation could have been if he didn't break his foot 
and miss or break his ankle. He had a, a, a lower body injury that cost him a significant amount of time after the first, I think that was the second game into his second season where he was really going to get the opportunity to be a starter. But man, I struggle with the idea of McCarthy as the second quarterback taken with Jaden Daniels on the board there or with Drake May. I think he makes a ton of sense. So if you're Minnesota, if you're the Broncos, and if you're Vegas, I think McCarthy makes a lot of sense, depending on how you have your your prospects stacked. Because those are better situations. Those are better situations. Although, I don't know that a first overall pick is going to walk into a better situation than in history than what Chicago has now for Caleb Williams. Very unique scenario. But still, atypical. Minnesota, Denver, and Vegas make the most sense because they'll be picking in, you know, outside of the top 10 right now unless they trade up. And even if they do trade up and overdraft a quarterback a little bit, if seven is seven the is seven a reach for the fourth best quarterback on the board? Depends who the fourth best quarterback on the board is. In this case, it's McCarthy, it sounds like. I think it's the most perpetually overdrafted position that we have. For good reason. People need quarterbacks. You can't do anything if you don't have a baseline functioning quarterback. There's enough QB needy teams outside of the top 10 that makes me think there's going to be movement into that top four or five, whether that's New England trading back out and deciding they just don't have a good setup right now for a rookie quarterback. Maybe learning their lesson a little bit from what was around Mac Jones the last couple of years or if it's Arizona trading back out of four, or even L.A., who has a ton of needs. The Chargers have a lot of needs. I think somebody's going to crack that top five of that. Who are we putting in that category of teams that could move in and will be the ones making those phone calls? Vegas, Denver, Minnesota? Those are the three. Atlanta's the other quarter, but they're eight. They're sitting there right behind you. Yeah, for them, it's like, are they happy enough with their roster to go ahead and get a guy from the fu- for the future despite giving Kirk Cousins that big contract? It's a complicated question. But McCarthy being the answer at two in Washington is wild to me. I don't know what the hell they're doing in Washington. Now, that doesn't mean that it won't work out and they won't be competitive because the NFC East seems to be a little volatile as of late. It's a weird combination of coaches and of personnel that they've had in free agency. And I and I know things went sideways from the start when they didn't get the coach that they were lusting after and ended up landing with Dan Quinn, but still, the whole the whole offseason in Washington has been bizarre. This would add an extra wrinkle to it. But I to revisit the Mac Jones Trey Lance discussion, Mac Jones would have been the correct pick for the Niners there. I know it's so easy to do with results in hand and You can't expect things to go as poorly in New England as they did for Mac Jones. You can't expect things to go as terribly for Trey Lance as they ended up being. So there's no there's no multiverse scenario in which we can revisit that particular trade other than to look back at and say, yeah, the guy that was the best college quarterback we've seen since Joe Burrow by the statistics probably should have been probably should have been the guy that fit the best in the kind of offense that Shanahan wants to run, even if he's not the best athlete or, you know, the tallest or the fastest or the strongest arm, the way that Trey Lance had a lot of those qualities to him without the refinement. Should we be talking more about the Giants, too, taking a quarterback at six? God. With everything that's come out about Daniel Jones? Titans fans should hope so. Yeah, are you kidding? That would be great for them. J.J. McCarthy at two would be great for Titans fans. No, any as many quarterbacks can go before seven benefits you. Of course, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, would New York really do it? I mean, I don't I I don't know, but it, Lucas, it's a year after they gave Daniel Jones that money. It's he played six games after they gave him all that money just to be done with him. I mean, I know I listen, when it's not quite Josh Rosen, Rosen and Kyler Murray, but I guess if you if you cannot see a path forward with this person, even after you've already paid him, then it's better to just cut bait instead of waiting for the situation to resolve itself or incrementally improve. I think the worst mistake that teams make is waiting too long to move on from these players. 
But what the hell are you doing giving him that contract in the first place? Anyway, we should we should be talking more about it. People in New York seem to think, and just talking to our friend Madeline Burke, it seems to be wide receiver or bust in the way that we're talking about almost tackle or bust here. We'll see what they what they end up doing. 615-737-1045. You can join the discussion. Tony is in Alabama up next. Hey, Buck. Hey, Lucas. Can you guys hear me? I'm driving. I apologize. You're just fine. Loud. Hey, man. So, I think we're overthinking this a little bit. A lot of Titans fans, you know, it's, it's almost like we're trying to bring back J-Rob. You can never go full J-Rob on this. I mean, the offensive line last year was a turnstile at multiple positions. And to think that you can't fix that or we have the luxury of taking anything other than a tackle at seven is kind of insane to me. I mean, to paraphrase John McKay, the late great John McKay, you know, we couldn't pass block, but we made up for that by not being able to run block either. So, <laughs> I mean, I know I know Callahan's a great offensive line coach, but I mean, you can't polish some of the turds we got sitting in that 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 group right now, and you got to get that man something to work with. It it's just we can't afford that luxury of not taking a tackle. Just my opinion. Thanks for listening. Sure. And just to be clear, we're not we're not saying don't take a tackle at all. It just does it the, the bigger question, and, and to Tony's point, I, I understand Tony's larger emphasis, which is don't don't uh keep it simple, stupid. Just take the tackle. And that's the premise of your argument. Keep it simple, stupid. The difference between the discussion between receiver and tackle, too, is when you draft a receiver, he doesn't have to be the guy right now. When you draft the left tackle, he's got to be the guy right Right now. away. Day one. Right away. And I know receiver, you want to look to the future because Calvin Ridley's 29 and D-Hop's in the last year of his deal, but the left tackle thing is is about the now more than it is the future. Yeah, because, I mean, the, the worst thing, yeah, uh, the, the worst thing that you can do is try and patchwork it with what you've got because I know they're going to give Raidens an opportunity to compete. Sounds like it's going to be inside at guard. I would love a better right tackle than NPF. I that guy has v- really underwhelmed. I know it's a small sample size, but still, and I sure as hell don't want the experience of him on the left side. Corey in Hendersonville is next. Hey, Corey. Hey guys. Um, so one thing that I don't think that I've heard anybody talking about is the possibility of the Giants taking um, Joe Alt at six, um, simply because. They gave up, they gave up so many sacks last season. You would think offensive line might be something that they would be targeting as well. And I'm curious if Alt were to go off the board before the Titans pick, and they're not in love with Bashanu, and they did, and they choose to go with you know a, a playmaker, who would be available in the second round potentially at 38 that you could see the Titans going after as far as an offensive lineman. Uh, I appreciate the call, Corey. So the Giants are just hurt. They have Evan Neal. They have Andrew Thomas. Um, they have their tackle situation locked up. Now, it doesn't mean that they can't go offensive line at six, though that would be pretty high for a guard. But um, they're just they're just miserably injured, and that's been the, the situation. So why don't we talk about that coming up next? We'll also get into the idea how fixed is the Titans roster through the first couple of waves of free agency. We'll continue to take your calls. I'm Buck Rising. It's 104.5 The Zone. Below MSRP, below MSRP, below MSRP. It's pretty simple. Two Rivers Ford sells all new non-specialty Fords below MSRP. The guaranteed offer is the easiest way to sell your home. It's really simple. We bring you an all-cash offer. You close in as little as 21 days. No home inspections, no lockboxes. No open houses. Go to MarkSpain.com to get a guaranteed offer and start packing.
Welcome back to the show. Offseason continues. Legereus need not yet official, but we can uh, keep you updated with the latest. I'm sure there'll be a press conference here in the near future. Medicals have been cleared. Terms have been agreed to. All that's left to do is to physically sign the piece of paper uh, for the new contract that Legereus Need will play under. And at that point, they can announce him as the newest member of your team. So for those of you who are asking, just a little more patience on that. How fixed is the roster now with the latest addition of Sneed? Because Mike Herndon has been doing a a good photoshopping job, I guess. he's He took the Titans depth chart graphic from the team's website and he just started the offseason with a bunch of red, red bars over all the names and spots where there would be starting players. And the only players that he had starting at the start of the offseason, obviously, were guys like Hopkins and Simmons and Harold Landry and Roger McCreary, just a handful of players that were available. And since then, he's gone about filling it out every time they add a player. The Titans offense now looks substantive is a word that I'd use. Hopkins and Ridley on the outside, Traylon Burks in the slot, offensive linemen, starting offensive linemen, Skaronsky, Cushenberry, Brunskill. Question mark. Question mark at either tackle. Chig is the tight end. Levis, obviously the quarterback. I'm good with Tony Pollard as the 1A. I'm good with Tajay Spears as the 1A. I don't, you know, it'll probably depend on who they play every week. Remember, they brought back Julius Chestnut as well. I do recall that. So running back feels like a box checked at this point. Is Hassan Haskins ever going to do anything? I don't know. Okay. It seems like a pretty broad question for me to ask, but just anything at all would be nice. God, these draft classes, man. It, it's insane. <laughs> I mean, what? I, I know we come back to this all the time, but holy hell, these insane. classes suck. I mean, it is just, like, just a casual throwaway. I haven't thought about Hassan Haskins for six months. And just realizing that he's contributed absolutely nothing to the football team as a former, it's not asking it's a third round pick, fourth, fourth round pick, fourth a thought from Michigan. Either way, just nothing. Yeah, because uh, NPF and Malik were the two third round picks. Haskins was the fourth round pick, and then Chig in the fifth. Sounds right. That sounds right. NPF in there somewhere. NPF was third as well. Tom Pelissero is reporting. The two Indianapolis Colts defensive backs have been suspended for gambling. I thought that's what you said. How? I was just making sure. Okay. <laughs> so, point being, you need two tackles on offense, but for the most part, your offensive depth chart's pretty well filled out. Now, I personally would like to see a better option than Burks, and I think that that can be accomplished in the draft. He has a roster spot to earn now more than ever with a new general manager that didn't draft him and a new coaching staff that is looking to upgrade all over the place. So Traylon Burks and Kyle Phillips, 100% on notice, which is exactly where I want them if I'm a Titans fan. Some level of urgency, some level of competition to bring in with these guys and to see what the best possible outcome is. But for, I mean, when I read you that depth chart, that starting, or that starting lineup, rather, not just the depth chart, because depth depth wise, you've got NWI, feel good about that. You've got Phillips, it's a shoulder shrug, but whatever. Um, You do have Colton Dow on the roster. He started to make a little bit of progress before he blew out his knee. And we expect a draft pick there. Like, in a way that we more concretely expect... A draft pick there. We expected one last year, and we've done this before with the Titans a couple years ago when they waited until the fourth to trade up for Des Fitzpatrick. I think we expected a receiver pick earlier in that draft as well, but with what we know about Brian Callahan, I think we have more reason to believe they will spend at least one draft pick in the first three to four rounds on a receiver. Kyrus Jackson and Mason Kinsey are also under contract, but those are more practice squad potential special teams players. Um, than they are guys we're talking about on a two deep. 
Now, if you're, if the linemen that you had were depth offensive linemen, I would feel okay about that. With Jalen Duncan, Sadiq Charles, you've got uh, Radens who will compete at guard, and you've got NPF. If that was your backup situation as opposed to those guys having to play meaningful snaps at all, I would feel pretty good about that. Left tackle and right tackle both could use a positional upgrade. Now to the defense. Uh, defense is much more, I don't know, patchwork is the word that I'll use for the time being. And Sneed goes a long, long way, so I don't want to discount that at all. To have a secondary that features Cheeto Awuze, Roger McCreary, Legarius Sneed, Amani Hooker, Elijah Molden, and a safety to be named later, I feel cautiously optimistic about that group. Your front is what concerns me for the same reasons that we've talked about. I think that Arden Key, I think in an ideal world, Arden Key would be relegated to a backup. I think if you could if you could bump Arden, I, I don't think it's happening this offseason, but I think if you could get Arden Key in that Rashad Weaver role, I'd feel a hell of a lot better about Arden Key. I think he's better than a Rashad Weaver role. No, he is. Be- well, he's he, better than Rashad Weaver. Brian Callahan said to Jim Wyatt, because he talked about the edge rusher position, and he said they like what they have in Harold Landry, and he called Arden Key a good situational pass rusher. That's probably what he is, right? A situational pass rusher. Sure, which would make him better in the Rashad Weaver role. Right. Callahan mentioned, in so many words, we probably want to add someone there. Like, you expect the Titans to bring in another edge rusher. And then Caleb Murphy and Weaver kind of being the depth pieces at the bottom of that chart. I mean, I don't really need to see Murphy. I don't know that Weaver and uh, Murphy, in an ideal world, I don't know that they're on the roster. You know what I'm saying? But this is not, they can't do everything in one offseason, and the upgrades have to be at multiple positions. So my my viewpoint of that is more idyllic or idyllic than what they're actually going to be able to accomplish. But if you're able to bring in someone opposite Landry, that at this point would probably be in the draft. Key as that rotational guy is a massive upgrade over Weaver as that rotational piece. Agreed. Now, you have to find the piece that makes Arden Key rotational because at this point, that's not an option for you. Um, Looking at the depth chart on defense, obviously you have Simmons. You have Sebastian Joseph Day, who I guess in this setting is your... He's more a nose tackle than he is Danico. You know? He's not really a, a guy that you can line up on the outside and the inside and stunt and twist with that way. He's he's almost exclusively an interior defensive lineman. Would you have liked the Titans to bring Derek Barnett in? I was thinking about Barnett as a guy that could be interesting to bring in before the Texans did end up bringing him back and continuing to beef that front seven. In terms of depth. Yeah. I mean, especially for the price point. That that would have been an option to explore. Now, I don't know how I don't know how much they did explore that option. He he may have preferred to stay in Houston. He may have cut a Houston a sweetheart deal to go along with that. I mean, they have crazy depth right now. When Derek Barnett, you're you're talking about maybe I mean, Derek Barnett is better than the second best Titans pass rusher right now, and he's probably like sixth on their list. On Behind the- Daniil Hunter, Danico Autry, Will Anderson. Correct. Man. I mean, it's it's a pretty stout defensive line group. Um, inside linebacker, you have Kenneth Murray as a starter, but he's definitely going to be more of a... I mean, he's not your coverage linebacker, and he's not your green dot linebacker. So right now, here's what it looks like. Hooker starting safety. Awuzi, McCreary, Sneed as your three corners if you're playing uh, in nickel defense. You've got Murray as an inside linebacker. You have Sebastian Joseph Day, Jeff Simmons, and Harold Landry. Arden Key is a starter because you have nobody else. Virtually no depth. None. You have quality starters in some spots, but virtually no depth. Uh, if your depth consists of Trey Avery, Caleb Farley, and Eric Guerrero, 
I corner. still have, you know, my concerns about how long this defense can sustain over the course of a 17 game regular season. Because you can't you can't count on the three of them being available for every single game. What's the biggest hole left on defense? Because it's not corner. Edge. Edge? Yeah. I don't I do not feel good about their front. I'd I'd be willing to say inside linebacker because of how much of Kenneth Murray's success I feel like hinges on the guy playing next to him. Man, if Jack Gibbons is a starting linebacker this year, I'm going to be pissed. I wonder how high they take an inside linebacker in this draft. That's what I'm saying. Junior, like, the the idea of Junior Colson, like... In the second round at 38? I, there's no way he's there at the second round. He's the best inside linebacker in the class. He's going to go in the first I round. don't know if that's such a surefire thing that he's the best inside linebacker in this draft. Who else is in the conversation? Oh... The name is escaping me. You're not talking about the wrestler, are you? What wrestler? Oh, it's, um, oh my God. <laughs> this is going to drive me crazy. Um, I'm blanking on the name. Is this the same problem you're having? I don't know who you're talking about. <laughs> okay, excellent. Either way, I don't think that there's a better inside linebacking prospect right now than Junior Colson. Nashville's own. I think that that would not please a lot of Titans fans, but I, I'm i not shrugging off the idea of an inside linebacker, Lucas. They don't have anybody to run the defense. Peyton Wilson is who I'm thinking of. Thank you, Kevin Davis. Um, I'm thinking of the A&M prospect. Who's the A&M linebacker prospect? So... But just keeping it focused on the Titans for a second, you can look that up. Edrin Cooper. Okay. Edrin Cooper, who I know Coach Mack is in love with. I really am concerned with the idea of who's going to run the defense. Because it's not like, I mean, what what happened when they couldn't trust Rashawn Evans to do it? They gave it to Kevin Byard when Jayon Brown was missing time. Now, it's rare that you have a safety organizing your defense not that Kevin Byard is incapable and did so with relative success, but still, you're putting a ton of strain on a position that already has a lot of strain on it to have to make sure that everybody's right from the very furthest point of the defense. I am um, I'm really concerned about that. But, Lucas, if they don't have anybody to get after the quarterback with Jeff and Harold, and Arden's just a supplementary piece at best, then I don't know how you can't look at the premium positions and not be concerned. Again, they have the draft to address this. So we don't know what exactly their their strategy or their path forward might be. We know they, they took some swings on some players. They scheduled some meetings with some players that didn't make it to them in the free agent process. So this probably has not gone perfectly to plan for them either. The adjustments that they've made have been exceptional, both on Calvin Ridley and Legereus Sneed. But it doesn't make up for everything, right? And that's the problem that they're still having to work through, which is why this is a multi-offseason issue, their roster construction. This is what you have to balance in free agency, right? Like, how much better would we feel about this defense if Aziz Alshayer and Danico Autry were back? Well, they tried to keep them. Yep. But you probably don't get Ridley if that's the case. Yeah, how do you think Titans fans feel about that? The idea that they have... Ridley, but not Danico Autry and Aziz Alshair. I'm willing. I'm willing to bet that most of them are are good with it. I think so. I think the big swing on offense is where people will lean. But that Danico one's scary. I mean, Aziz is scary. It's, it's all. It's not. It's not great. Texans not, had more money for him. Not great, Bob. Uh six one five seven three seven one zero four five is the number. We'll get back to the phones here in just a second. Reminder that you can get your tickets. For the live taping of the install with Greg Cosell, hosted by myself at the Analog at the Hutton Hotel on Friday, May the 3rd. You can be there in the house as Cosell breaks down the Tennessee Titans 2024 draft class, the free agency class, Legereus Sneed trade, all of it, and how it's going to fit in Brian Callahan's offense and Denard Wilson's defense. We're going to take questions from the audience. We're going to talk about the division as well. Tickets are on sale right now for $25 to purchase tickets Go to 1045thezone.com today, and Lucas will also do me the courtesy of dropping it in the Zone TV chat for those of you watching on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Twitch. We're using that event to raise money for Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, so we hope 
you are there, and we hope that you're generous. We appreciate you guys. Everybody who's bought tickets already, get your tickets today at 1045thezone.com. Kyle is in Smyrna. Hey, Kyle. Hey, guys. Almost caught me uh, working again, talking. <sighs> you got but, it. Uh, all right, yeah. Um, I believe in Will Levis. I think he is the guy in three years. He's going to be a pro bowler, all pro. So I want to go ahead and get his protection. We should get Joe Alden at number seven, 38. Take the best tackle, right tackle out there. I don't care if it's the Fisher from Notre Dame, the other guy, or Paul. Just take them. We're going to – it's going to take a two-year rebuild. So some guys like linebacker, safety, defensive tackle, they're going to have to get picked up in the draft. Just and they can be death pieces. After the draft, they will have a. They will be guys cut and released because rookies will be outperforming the veterans for other teams cheaper. They'll let them go. That can be our green dot linebacker. He just needs to be more athletic than Jack Gibby, but have the brains of him to be able to call the plays. Thanks for the call. That's that's a good point by Kyle. You're gonna have you're gonna have releases throughout the course of training camp. You're gonna have teams trimming down their roster, and it's not to say that you can't pick up a veteran linebacker, somebody who um, may have a bloated contract figure or something like that, who does get beaten out of their job by a rookie or a, another free agent acquisition, something like that. These these are options on the table, so it doesn't just end with the draft process. Free agency doesn't really end. It just continues to roll roll along. It's why they have reserves of money budgeted for these specific kind of things. Justin is in Smyrna next. Hey, Justin. Hello? Yes. So, if Joe Alt and Brock Bowers are both gone at seven, what's your opinion of them taking edge rusher there, or is it just a trade down spot? Dallas Turner, come on down. Greg thinks it's Latu, the best edge rusher really? in the class from UCLA. Got that SEC bias. You do? Yes. Understandably. At seven? I mean, you can't rule it out. I love Jared Verse. I don't know that I'd do it at seven, given this team's needs, but... You can't rule out the possibility. This is this is why this seventh pick is such a such a fun hypothetical tool to play around with. Because you could do basically anything but quarterback at seven if you're the Titans and be for the most part correct because you have needs everywhere. Basically, quarterback and cornerback now are off the table. And running back probably. Maybe don't do a running back. Six one five seven three seven one zero four five. We'll take more of your phone calls. We'll also talk some hoops. Sweet sixteen action getting ready to be underway. Vols don't play until late tomorrow night, but we'll get into a little bit of tournament stuff coming up next.
We got some hoops coming up. Sweet 16 getting ready to get underway. BVS non-existent. What's the BVS level? Creighton the opponent. Sweating it out against Texas, a game that I knew that I watched knowing you won and still thought the entire time that you were going to lose <laughs> because, oh, my God, the shooting percentage that night, hideous uh, against the Longhorns. You still squeak it out anyway. What is the level of BVS with Creighton on the horizon? BVS is a funny thing because uh, you never know what's going to trigger it. Nothing has triggered it leading into this game. I was very confident going into the Texas game. I was very confident that this team had the scoring depth and the defense to get out of the opening weekend. But when Jonas Adu missed his first layup early on in the first half, the BVS started to set in, and it only amplified throughout the course of that game. However, I'm still confident going in against Creighton, and we talked a little bit about this game, but I think Tennessee could take advantage of, of Creighton's lack of depth, not so much from a fatigue perspective, because I don't think that really factors in at this point. Like, they get a whole week off. They have multiple guys that will play every minute of yeah. this game. And it's not like Tennessee's biggest strength is getting big men into foul trouble and taking it to the hoop and forcing them into those situations. But if they can manage some of that against Kalkbrenner, the seven-footer, then I feel very, very good. Because Creighton just has no depth. They can't go to their bench for much of anything. And I just think Tennessee's going to snap out of this cold streak that they were in against Texas. Like, I, I don't think you see those shooting numbers in back-to-back -back games. That you survived a shooting performance like that and still advance to give you confidence. Well, God, that's a that's a funny way to look at it. No, <laughs> it should. It, the it, fact that I you understand can look what at you're it saying, say, that you got through the bad, the, the bad night, that you got through the bad shooting night, and still came out with a win against still a quality alive. opponent. Yeah. Texas is a solid basketball team. You can't continue to have those kind of struggles, obviously, and expect to win games, even as Tennessee was able to do it against Texas. The, the matchups tonight are fun. Um, North Carolina and Alabama is going to highlight this whole thing. It's a 839 Central Time tip on CBS. They're playing in Los Angeles. I, I'm surprised to see Alabama as the other team from the SEC still kicking. Me too. Especially between the two of them, I would have taken Kentucky to go far further than this Alabama, this particular Alabama team. And UNC, they're a different kind of matchup for them because they can play with good pace. They can keep up with Alabama if necessary. Um, they do it in much shorter spurts is, I guess, how I would describe it based on the sample size so far. Defense is an afterthought for Alabama. It cannot be against North Carolina. And it's not for North Carolina. No, absolutely not. They're one of the best defensive teams in the country. That's the best matchup on the board. I would say, I would argue this weekend, like the most interesting game because of the different variants, I think we can get from a kind of uh, from a kind of matchup like that. Arizona Clemson is also an interesting one, and that is tonight too. I like Iowa State Illinois tonight. Illinois, I feel like, is one of quietly one of the hottest teams in the country. Illinois fans hate their basketball team, which makes no sense to me because I would I would die for a basketball team to they think they are underperforming. I mean, now in the turn, or at least in Big Ten play, they felt like an underperforming team, even though their record was exceptional. They won the Big Ten tournament. Yeah. And they're still winning. And their offense is as efficient as anyone's in the country. And Iowa State's defense, as efficient as anyone's in the country. So that's a really fun matchup, the 2 3 in the East Regional. That is that is late tonight. That's, I believe, the 9 10 tip tonight. We got anything for the Aztecs against UConn? Little national championship game rematch. Yeah. I completely forgot that that was the national championship game. I did too. Completely forgot. That's I was what... listening to my uh, my uh, uh, Inside College Basketball podcast to kind of refresh my memory with Gary Parrish and them. And when they said the a rematch of last year's national championship game, I said San Diego oh, right. State was in the championship game? <laughs> well, that's what UConn did last year. They blew everyone off the floor. They just ran everybody out of the gym so routinely that you just you forgot who they even played because it didn't matter. They did the same thing to everybody. And so far, they're doing the same thing in this tournament. I don't see how UConn goes down tonight. I'd be surprised. I want to see UConn 
run into a real contender in this bracket, and I don't think it's San Diego State. Good basketball team, but I don't think it's happening for the Aztecs. Are the Vols capable of making it past Creighton and into the Elite Eight for only the second time in program history? This season is successful to me already, just by nature of them being in the Sweet 16. Now, how they perform against Creighton, obviously, is how they're going to be judged. I know there's a lot of Vols fans who have national championship expectations. You you 100% should. This team is totally capable in this field of competing for a national title. They would have to face UConn before that happens, and I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. But what they what they have in this situation, understanding that they survived probably about as poor a performance as we've seen them have, I feel pretty good about the Vols at least getting through Friday night. I think they're capable of beating Creighton on Friday. Absolutely, they're capable. Sure. I mean, I think they're capable of beating anybody they're matched up with. What team? I don't is- know if they're capable of beating UConn. UConn a really good bet. UConn head and shoulders above every other team in the field to me. So I don't know that I would I would say just casually that Tennessee is capable of beating UConn. Like in, it would have to be best case scenario for the Vols to be able to get by UConn. Yeah, and that would be a national championship game matchup if it happened. So Tennessee capable of of anybody they get matched up with on the way to potentially the national championship game. Do you like that? We talked about this the other day that there are no Cinderella's in the Sweet 16, that we had the upsets in the first round, we had Oakland over Kentucky, we had Yale over Auburn, but the quote-unquote Cinderella's got bounced on opening weekend in the second round. Yeah, get Jimmy Neutron out here, out of here after he beats uh, after he beats Kentucky. Love, I don't... To, love the NIL deals he's getting, though. Is he? Yeah. Is he capitalized? Uh, Good. Buffalo Wild Wings, State Farm, Good. like they're pouring in. State Farm. Yep. Oh, real money. NC State is the only double-digit seed left in the tournament as an 11, and they're the ACC champs. They went on that crazy run of the ACC tournament. Do you like that, that it's a little chalky? I don't want Cinderella's. I'm I'm all set. Like, uh, you can keep your Loyola of Chicago's and your sister Jean's. They just ruined the experience for me. Now, they had a legitimately good team the year that they made the Final Four run, but I I don't need uh I don't need Duquesne making it out of the first weekend. Okay? It's it's a it's a great story. Get them the hell out of here after that. I would rather see the best basketball teams, the best players in, in the country competing at the highest levels. Or as Robert Walsh calls them, Duquesne. <laughs> Andrews and Franklin up next. Hey, Andrew. Hey, how you doing? Good. Uh, so you're talking about the best game of the weekend. North Carolina and Alabama tonight should be awesome. But as everybody loves to do, look ahead. Uh, if North Carolina plays Arizona, one, it's a great game. But two, Caleb Love is the point guard for Arizona. He's also the guy that beat Duke and Coach Krzyzewski in mm. his final game. So the storyline's there. I mean, as a Carolina fan myself, I'll self-admit it, um, we saw the bracket come out on Selection Sunday, and everybody kind of trembled going, ah, crap, Caleb Love for the Final Four? Are you serious? Coach K killer. Not to mention, Final Four's in Phoenix. Ooh. So that game would be for Arizona to be playing the Final Four essentially at home. Yeah, but North Carolina would have a huge contingent. Oh, huge. Absolutely. No, I'm saying the winner of that game, would go to the Final Four in Phoenix. Oh, okay. Uh, the winner of that game in the Elite Eight, if it is UNC and Arizona. And Arizona knocked off UNC on their home floor, didn't they, this season? Didn't they go to, to Chapel Hill? Andrew, and is that right? They beat Duke in Cameron. Oh, it was Duke. That's right. It was Duke. Caleb Love got another one over on Duke. <laughs> just just won't stop kicking Duke fans while they're down. Incredible. <laughs> Love that. Uh, final hours coming up next. Does Calvin Ridley make you feel better about losing Danico Autry and Aziz Alshair? There were some comments from the general manager at owners' meetings to that effect. We'll talk about it next.
It is 12.02. Good afternoon. I'm Lucas Panzica from the 104.5 The Zone Studios. NFL free agency news. Jadavian Clowney off the board. The former Titans and Ravens pass rusher is headed home to Carolina. He will play for the Panthers on a two-year deal worth $20 million up to $24 million. College hoops. Vanderbilt set to officially introduce new men's basketball coach Mark Byington in a press conference today. That's at 4 p.m. Byington went 82-36 and 36 in four years as the head coach at James Madison knocking off Wisconsin in the first round of the NCAA tournament just last weekend. The Sweet 16 starts tonight. Clemson in Arizona in the West region at 610. San Diego State takes on top-seeded UConn at 640. National championship rematch from last year. And Alabama plays one-seed UNC in Los Angeles at 840. The night wraps up with Illinois taking on Iowa State at 910. You can hear all the Westwood One coverage of the action right here on the zone. The Nashville Predators point streak is at 18 games. They will look to extend it as they hit the road tonight at the Arizona Coyotes puck drop at 9 p.m. For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and Vols. This is 104.5 The Zone. Final hour is here. We're happy to have you with us. Lucas and I got you till 1 o'clock. Thanks for hanging. Brian Callahan had some interesting comments at the owners' meetings with, uh, is this finable, our good friend, Kevin Clark of ESPN. He is our good friend, whether Lucas wants to find me or not for it. Kevin Clark has a show that he does for ESPN called This Is Football. They interviewed a variety of different coaches at the NFL owners' meetings, including Brian Callahan, whom Kevin told me is a great quote and certainly put it on display in this interview, just with the level of insight he was able to lend to how the Titans' offense might look in 2024. So Callahan was asked specifically about Calvin Ridley, and without giving too much away, how he might be used within the context of this new Titans offense. And Brian Callahan said, uh, a compared him to a player he's recently had in terms of his role that is going to make Titans fans pretty excited. Yeah. I mean, you're looking at a very similar role that, that Jamar played in terms of, um, his ability to move, move around the formation, Mm -hmm. use him in motion. Um, he's got such a unique skill set. He's got great quickness. He's got great speed. Uh, he can run all the different routes. You saw some of that in Jacksonville, too. Um, he can win outside. He can win inside. He can do a lot of different – he's got a lot of different things he does well. And so I'm excited about that is, is finding where he fits. But if you look at how we use Jamar, there's going to be some similarities to, to how we can use Calvin. Well, that's exciting. Now, he's not saying in the clip that Calvin Ridley can be Jamar Chase. Nobody's doing that. But the role – the versatility of it, how many different ways they can deploy him, that's the exciting part of a guy like Calvin Ridley with DeAndre Hopkins who can be your true on-the-line, split-out wide receiver X. He's looking forward to, I think, having a couple of different pieces at his disposal, him being Callahan. And Hopkins, what they bring for one another. We talked to Nate Washington about it last week, or I guess, what was that, two weeks ago last week? At some point in the last couple of weeks. Nate Washington, former Titans wide receiver, gave a really, really good interview about how he this raises his level of expectation for DeAndre Hopkins, who had a great season by any accounts, played in all 17, uh, 17 games, seven touchdowns, over 1,000 yards receiving. He was phenomenal in a really, really bad situation. And Nate Washington thinks that he can be better. How much they, how much they kind of move Ridley around is going to help Will Levis because a player like that can immediately help define the throw for Levis and make his life just generally easier as a quarterback, not just because he's a talented player, 
because of all of the things that you can do pre-snap to identify stuff on the defense and give him additional answers to the test that he might not already have or might not immediately have as soon as they get lined up out there. There's a lot of different ways that Calvin Ridley can help this thing. And I don't know how much better it makes Titans fans feel to know that the Calvin Ridley money is basically what you would have spent on Danico Autry and Aziz Alshair, but that's what Jimmy Wyatt of TennesseeTitans.com alluded to yesterday when he spoke uh, to us about his conversations with general manager Rand Carthon. When I talked to Rand on Sunday, you know, he we were talking about how things played out, and he, you know, talked about how they lost Danico and – uh, and Aziz, and because of that, they had a little bit more money that they uh, didn't know that they were necessarily going to be able to. And they and don't get me wrong, the cap room, the, the money they have to spend is has not dried up completely. But I think they had certain ranges for certain players and had money allocated to certain guys. And when they left, it did free up, you know, some money that they didn't know was going to be available. And then Ridley was still there, so they did jump in on him very aggressively at that point. And they had competition. It was interesting. Robert Kraft talked about that at the owners meetings, just how they wanted Ridley. And they were trying to get to a point because of the, the because of the state tax difference being here compared to there. They were trying to get to the point with their contract where they were going to make it even. And, and, um, and, and Kraft was very honest and forthcoming saying that Ridley's, girlfriend wanted to be in the south he wanted to be in the south and uh and he liked the quarterback here so they they got themselves in a position to um, to close the deal with him and uh and i think a lot of that was because they had money that they didn't know they were going to have his wife by the way ridley's wife what did jimmy say he, he was referencing robert Kraft. it wasn't jimmy but bob Kraft said were you not paying attention to the Jimmy thing? No, no. Oh, did he say girlfriend? Yeah, Robert Kraft said, yeah, Calvin's girlfriend oh, wanted to be okay. wanted to stay in the South. I'm sorry. He's married with a child. But <laughs> the you talk about the we suck luxury tax all the time mm-hmm. with the Titans. What about the Patriots? How much do the Patriots have to overpay to try and get guys like Calvin Ridley to come? Hey, come play for this team whose roster is terrible, who has, uh, has a first-year head coach. Who doesn't have an answer at quarterback. No answer at quarterback. Who does not play in a scenic location, and the weather nope. is brutal. The state income tax is a factor. Like, Patriots, do they have to pay the We Suck luxury tax more than anybody right now? Mm-hmm. But the problem is they keep getting outbid <laughs> on the We Suck luxury tax. Because, I mean, New England. New England's biggest selling point was Tom Brady plus... Tom Brady willing to give up money. So they were always circumventing things that might make it harder to sign players if you're the New England Patriots because the greatest quarterback of all time is always a selling point, but also he's pretty cost effective. And you're probably going to get a ring out of it. Yeah. Um, He is, Bob Kraft is in an interesting position. And they, I mean... I would argue they're the most interesting team in the draft this year, the Patriots, because Giardi seems to be signaling in Boston that it's not definitive that they would take a quarterback with a third overall pick, which I can't imagine a situation in which that's the case and you just roll into the future with Jake Brisket. I don't know. I, I, you hope they've learned from what Mac Jones had around him the last couple of years. What is the quarterback pick at three walking into in New England right now? And I get it. You're there, and you don't know if you're going to be there again. But And it's a good quarterback class. You have no idea what it's going to look like a year from now. But I wonder if they do go that route of let's build out a roster and then try to plug one in so we can start day one with the rookie QB contract and compete day one instead of waste it for one to two years and find yourself in a Chicago Bears situation where you're going into year three, year four of a quarterback with no idea about what you have. Join 104.5 The Zone for our 2024 Spring Golf Classic on Friday, May 17th at Greystone Golf Club. The 2024 Spring Golf Classic will be a day accompanied by great food, cocktails, and prizes. You can choose between two flights, 8 a.m. or 1 p.m., and spend the day teeing off with us on Friday, May 17th. To purchase a team, visit 104.5 The Zone. 
Bills.com today. It is an interesting uh, situation in New England. But for the Titans, I think that, I, I think overwhelmingly, Lucas, we put it to a poll, I'm pretty sure, how much better Titans feel, if they feel better at all, about the idea knowing the money for Danico Autry and Aziz Alshair essentially turned into Calvin Ridley, how much that lessens the blow for them. What's the uh, what's the results on the poll right now? Tune in to find out. That's not helpful. I wanted it now, not later. Am I not going to get it now? It'd be I'd have to open my phone and go to your. It would just it would be a whole thing. Oh, for God's sake, got a break.
So we honestly have not talked since I've been back a ton about Legarius Sneed. We got into it a little bit yesterday, but not really. It's a huge move. It solidifies your secondary. Still need safety help. Don't feel good about your depth corners. But you're a better team with him than you were without him. The knee stuff. He's got knee issues that he's dealt with over the course of some time. Kansas City seemed to have had a pretty significant plan in place to make sure to get him through his week-to-week responsibilities and make him available for game day, of which he did. The thing that you also have to account for is he was in a contract year, Legereus Sneed, so availability is always going to be at a premium, and unless it's like completely debilitating and keeping you off the field, these things are manageable. Athletes, when you say that Legereus Sneed has had issues with his knees before you you compared it to Tajay Spears right where he has had issues with his knees but they don't seem to be bothering him right now it's never impacted as I say never but in the last year of college Mm -hmm. and in his rookie year did it impact his availability or production one iota no no so until it does it's just something to keep an eye on. That's exactly how I feel about Legereus Sneed. So let me let me make a, an, an even more notable comparison for Titans fans, just because it was part of the justification, part of the coping that Titans fans did with this player on the way out the door. A.J. Brown has issues with his knees. Doesn't mean that A.J. Brown can't be available. He has been thoroughly available, I think, in almost every game in the last two seasons. I think he's missed one. One. One game in the last two seasons for Philadelphia, and that was something that Titans fans justify or tried to use to justify. And I know not all of you were justifying the trade, but like as you were working through your stages of grief. Coping. Yeah, it was a part of the coping process. It was a part of the coping process, yes. Injury prone and drop. No. (laughs) He's a diva. He makes TikToks when he has surgeries. (laughs) That I missed. That was funny. No, no. What a time. I'm home. We were were living on another planet, it feels like. (laughs) That that feels like an eternity ago. And it was really only three seasons, not even three seasons. It was literally uh, three years ago. Yeah, it was three years ago. So, still, it seems like 15. But anyway, AJ has to manage his knee situation. There are plenty of players in the NFL that have to manage certain situations that Legereus need past a physical Got the contract that he got. We'll sign it here in the next couple of days, if not next week, and be announced at a Titans press conference. Means that he's got a knee situation that he has to continue to manage, but it's not going to outright keep him from performing his duties as a corner on Sundays. So, where else can he help the Titans? Who else benefits from this player besides everybody on the defense? Well, Denard Wilson who has a long history of secondary coaching and secondary expertise. He has been able to maximize a lot of players everywhere that he's been. And when he, well, I guess first, but also last spoke with us, I think it was, what, a week before the combine is when they had the introductory press conferences for the coordinators. When Denard Wilson spoke about versatility within his defense, see if you can pick up on any themes of which would be applicable to Snead. Well, it goes back. It goes back to this: the more you can do, right? When you draft players, you know you you don't want to uh, peg a player in one one position. The more you can do to help the team become versatile, like you can have a corner that you know he he brings a different aspect, and he can line up at nickel, and he's a good blitzer. He can line up in the slot, right? This is a matchup game as well. You know, there's so many great receivers in this game, and the game is spread wide open. You want to have uh, people that's versatile. All right, to play numerous positions, to line up, to be able to adjust and adapt to what you're getting from the offense. So versatility at a premium there. Versatility is something that Snead brings. He's going to be your outside corner. He's going to be one of your outside corners. I think in a perfect world, this puts McCreary back on the inside and Cheeto can be your other outside corner. But it's not just about the versatility of the player. It's about an attitude and a style with which he plays. So we're saving a lot of the Sneed analysis 
from Greg Cosell for the live show on May the 3rd. You can get your tickets right now at 1045thezone.com. If you're live streaming, Lucas dropped the link in the chat for you guys earlier. Perhaps he'll be kind enough to do it again. And we'll break down. We'll, we're going to do deep dive, in-depth film studies of Legereus Sneed and how what he did in Kansas City and his skill set might be applicable to the Titan system that will be run under Denard Wilson. But it's not just about how he fits in the scheme. It's about what he brings that's extra. And that's something that Cosell spoke to yesterday on the podcast. Um, but the, here's the one thing I'll say about Snead, and then we'll leave it alone so we can get into more detail uh, You know, at the install on May 3rd. Um, he brings not only quality play, but he brings a swagger and an attitude. And I think in some ways that can be seen as just as important. So, cause he is a press man corner, which doesn't mean he has to play press every snap, but you see him get right in the face of receivers. He's physical, he's aggressive, he's competitive. And, you know, I'll just say this, they've now signed a woozy and Sneed. Uh, so what was a major weakness a year ago is now a strength. And the one thing about this league now, the way it's going is you can't, cover up for bad corner play and now they do not have bad corner play so think of it this way if you feel your corners aren't good enough that shrinks your playbook when you feel your corners are good and you can play man that expands your defensive playbook so we'll leave it at that but that's really the way it works feeling pretty good about legerious need yeah when Cosell talks about that the the mentality and the physicality at the line of scrimmage Nothing comes to mind for me more than his matchup with Tyreek Hill in the playoffs on that icy night in Kansas City. This dude had a hell of a run as far as top wide receivers that he had to defend last year. The Tyreek Hill matchup is a great example. Five catches, 62 yards on that night. It was one of his lowest performing nights just from a production perspective of the season for Tyreek Hill. The Titans game is up there, but he didn't play hardly in that game yeah. with an ankle injury. I remember Legereus Need talking. Him and Tyreek had kind of a back and forth in the offseason, last offseason. And Legereus Need's making appearances on NFL Network talking about Tyreek talks a lot of trash. He's talking about coming back to Arrowhead. Remember Tyreek had this whole thing about he can't wait to go play the Chiefs. And Legereus Need said, I've been taking notes. Well, we'll see when he comes to Arrowhead. And he got in his head. He was more physical than Tyreek Hill that night. He was physically and mentally tougher than Tyreek Hill that night. He's like smacking him around after the play yeah. is over, right? Giving him extra pushes. And I remember Blaine. Tyreek Hill's used to smacking people around. He's not used to getting smacked around. I remember Blaine glowing about Legereus Sneed after that game because of that style of play. Before, during the play, and after it. So the days of Titans corners lining up 10, 12, 13 yards off receivers feel like they might be over, especially with Legereus Sneed. Can you imagine? Now, he is coming off as good a season as he's ever had, okay? This is an all-pro caliber season. He wasn't an all-pro. He was snubbed, and I think he was the most notable snub of any of the names that did make the all-pro list last year. Who were the corners? Uh, that's a great question. I know Legereus Sneed was not one of them. I'll look we, it up. Okay, we can go back. In fact, why don't we why don't we look it up while we hear from Andy Reid, who was uh, who was Jim Wyatt caught up with at owners meetings. No, it's Kaharski. Oh, excuse me, Paul Kaharski caught up with at owners meetings, speaking about the former Chiefs, now Titans corner. Yeah, um, one of my all time favorite guys. Um, great human being. As great a player as he is, he's even better human being. And um, as tough as you can imagine. Um, so I'm, I'm his, but I'm his biggest fan. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, you juggle this salary cap, and it's ridiculous um, what you have to go through, and the players you can keep and you can't keep, and you know, it's. Uh, um, but we all loved him there. It wasn't that wasn't the the problem. So he was our lockdown guy. He, uh, every uh, the best receiver. He had the best receiver. Now, lockdown guy. Reception percentage allowed. So, on a scale of 100, how many, what percentage of receptions do you think that Legereus Sneed allowed last year? Oh, man. I hate this game. I love this game. Because I have no idea, like, what the league average I don't, is. I don't care. Or, what percentage, Lucas? What per say it again. Read the parameters again. Reception percentage. What reception percentage out of 
did Legarius Sneed allow last 23. year? It's so much worse when you undercut it with an extreme number like that. You think he allowed 23% of passes I, to be I caught? I don't know what the what the What, what a ridiculous the thing. Media what a ridiculous thing to say by you. Doesn't know ball, Lucas Panzica. What do we talk? What? 42. God, 52. <laughs> okay, half. People are going to think he <laughs> People are going to think he allows every pass to be completed now because you start at 23. 23. 23%? 23, as I, I was thinking 23 isn't a good thing. Did I have that reversed? Should yes. I have said 73? I mean, no. 23 is it would be a phenomenal thing. 23 yeah. means that 75% of his passes, 77% of We're his passes completed. are not completed. Right, right. Yeah, that's not a thing at the NFL level. I hate you for doing that. <laughs> what do you think he allowed last year? I'm not playing. I'm taking my ball and I'm going home. 70.5%. Okay. So that his his average is 66.1%. Last year's number is well below the average of receptions that Legarius Sneed has allowed in his career. Now, there's some volatility to that number. It's not something that you can necessarily bank on, but from rookie season in 2020 to last year. 63.2, 75 percent, 70.5, 52.0% of receptions uh were completed in his direction. I'd like to ask Cosell if the Chiefs used him any differently in 2023 as opposed to 21 and 22. Just because he got to the backfield a lot more in those years. He had three and a half sacks in mm -hmm. 2022. That's a good point. So I'd just be curious to hear his perspective on that. He allowed a career low in terms of touchdowns, only two is what Pro Football Focus credited, credits him with. Uh, the previous year, he allowed five. The longest pass that he allowed last year was 54 yards. The previous was 45. So, so like, even if he's not an all-pro caliber player here, like, if he's not Legereus need of specifically last season, it's still a good deal. Because he they he's better than any corner that they had. He's one of the best players at his position, and you have to allow a little bit of variance at corner, I think more than any other position that you're talking about here. But I I, I still expect him to be a high-quality player, even if he's not Legereus Need All-Pro 2023 season. The first-team All-Pro corners of 2023 were Deron Bland, who was always going to get it because of his crazy pick six numbers? Which is is trash sure. because that's that's such an that's such a lazy way to do the all pro voting. Interception leaders. That's the, the amount of pick sixes he had. What, what was a five or six? No, something, it was ridiculous. Something crazy. Um, Sauce Gardner, worth it. Was the other one. Yeah. And the slot corner was Trent McDuffie, uh, Sneed's teammate. Right. Who is arguably as good a corner, yep. if not better corner, than is Legereus Sneed. Second team, Jalen Johnson in Chicago, who got a big deal mm -hmm. this offseason. And Charvarius Ward, the former MTSU star with the 49ers. The slot corner on the second team all-pro list was uh, Taron Johnson, Buffalo. Who just got paid. Yeah. Got paid big time. So Sneed helps a variety of different things. Um, but most importantly, he's your foundational piece in the secondary now. Because he's only 27 years old. And that's the thing that makes you feel best about a deal like this. You would have so much rather have seen them do this deal than take... Who, who was it that signed uh, uh, Tredavious White yesterday? I saw he got a deal. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's going to kill me. I'm going to look it up right now. Literally, we're talking about it. I yesterday. know. It's a terrible job by us. Uh, Tredavious White Rams. is a Los Angeles Ram. Uh, you would have rather Nine. seen... The Titans do the Sneed deal for the cost for the draft capital, and you know, understanding that a 2025 third and a seventh round pick swap is not, you know, game breaking draft capital. You would rather have seen them do that deal than give the one year prove it deal to Tredavious uh, White, who is 29 and coming off an Achilles tear. An Achilles tear for a corner to me is borderline no fly zone. There's just so many that that specific injury for that specific position can do as much harm as any. That's not a career ending injury. Like you can still mess around out there, but your your transition to safety is coming much sooner in your future than your standard corner without an Achilles tear might. The compensation was such a no brainer, right? 
Oh, yeah. A seventh-round pick swap and a third? No, and get a, out and of a here. future third? Future third. How lucky would you be to get a third-round pick that turns out to have the career of the Jerry Sneed, who was a fourth-round pick in 2020? That's exactly... When, when I talk about not getting too attached to draft capital, and again, that's not hard draft capital to consider giving up. It's a no-brainer, as you said. But... There are so few players who turn out to be actual proven commodities in any, in any given draft class, which is what we've witnessed over the last, I mean, not this last one in 2023, but the three previous from 2020 through 2022, just how big of a crapshoot it is. Now, they had a particularly bad hit rate over multiple seasons, and that doesn't happen to everybody in a way that's got this roster, you know, on life support coming into this offseason. But it sounds like the compensation wasn't a big holding up point. The money has always been the holding up yeah. point. The contract that you were going to have to give him on the back end is always going to be the holding up point. Because that's that's much more visceral for an organization. It's much more real for an organization. Draft capital is real. Draft capital matters. You have to be able to build your team organically to some extent to avoid some of the financial pitfalls that can come from having to overpay or patchwork things back together or building a team that's more comprised of veterans than you'd otherwise want to do it. And there are teams who have taken that kind of strategy and had success. The Rams, right? Famously bleep those picks. They, they have been able to do it in a different way, but also they can find a Puka Nakua in a, in a late round and turn him into as good a player as any wide receiver in football last year, based on how they're able to deploy him. On defense too. The Rams drafted so well last year. What are they going to do without Aaron Donald, though? They, they've they been able to get by, get away with a lot of stuff on defense because Aaron Donald is such a difference maker in the middle of there. We haven't talked at all about his retirement. I mean, what's there to say? He's done. Yeah. I didn't understand the surprise. Everybody acted so blindsided by Donald retiring. He, he's been talking about retirement since they won the Super Bowl, hasn't he? Yeah. Didn't he hint at it that year? And we didn't think well, he would he do it. Well, he hinted at it to get a raise. Sure. But I, I wasn't that surprised by it. It's felt like a year-to-year thing, or am I just totally reading that wrong? Well, I just think it's hard for people. It's hard for most people to imagine because most athletes don't do this. Walk away, literally. He led, he led the league in pass rush win rate just last year. Like it's not like there's been a drop off for Aaron Donald. He's been in the league a decade. He's made the Pro Bowl every year that he's been in the league, which is insane. I think it's just him. Is it just him and Barry Sanders? That have that kind of a record? He's literally accomplished everything there is to accomplish at his position. Yeah. And, and, he, and he's tired of his body hurting yeah. and getting sat on by not just one 300-pound offensive lineman, but as many as you can throw at him because he's a Tasmanian devil and you still can't stop him anyway. Talk about a shoe-in for the Hall of Fame. All right, are you happy that we did our Aaron Donald talk two weeks late? <laughs> Just I had, just I was just so had to mist- shoehorn that one in there. I was didn't so you? mystified by that one. Everybody's like, "Oh my god!" You've been trying to talk Aaron about Donald Aaron retired. You wanted to make it your dumbest thing in sports a couple of weeks. This like I three did. weeks ago. It, it was. All right, breaking news coverage as always, right here on the Buck Rising Show. Get out of here. <laughs> Last call for phone calls. If you got them, six one five seven three seven one zero four five. We will wrap up the show, update some polls, get you over to Blaine and Mickey. Coming up next.
Wrapping up here on this Thursday, Sweet 16 games tonight. It's been too long since we've gotten to watch basketball. They just, they inject you with so much basketball right out of the gates. And it's not very good basketball, but that doesn't matter because it's on at 11 a.m. in the morning and you're just happy to see sports, live sports, that you can watch literally uninterrupted for seven hours and into another day straight. And then they take it away from you. For a stretch of time, and you, this is what this is what withdrawal must feel like. Well, you don't like watching the NIT? No, I don't watch the NIT. You've been watching the women's tournament? I've uh, here and there, not a ton. Some great games, some great games. I what's, watched. what's the Sweet Sixteen looking like on the women's side? On the women's side, Iowa obviously still alive, mm, barely, barely though, barely. Yeah, that um, I saw. Indiana plays South Carolina. Yeah, I'm watching that game tomorrow in an Evansville, Indiana bar. Mm. I'm, I'm not going home for Easter. I, I said that I would come home from the Indiana women's game instead of Easter uh, to uh, to watch that game. But, yes, we are going to be in an Evansville, Indiana bar called Spanky's to watch that game at 4 p.m. with my family. Undefeated South Carolina, mm. 34-0. Don't feel good about that. So, Saturday, uh, there's only two SEC teams left on the women's side, just like the men's, unless you're counting Texas, who will be in the SEC next year. But LSU plays UCLA. That's on Saturday. Iowa plays five-seed Colorado. You should expect them to handle their business. But like I said, they had to scrape by against West Virginia, and there are some very questionable calls by the officials late in oh, that really? game. Really? Very quick. For Iowa. For Iowa, yes. Oh, conspiracy. Uh, Duke, UConn, Carol Lawson is crushing it at Duke. Like, she has built that thing up in three seasons, and they are 7C taking on 3-seed UConn Saturday night. My oh no of the week was Kelly Harper and the Lady Vols. Oh, my God. That that uh, foul that they called late that sent Kelly Harper just absolutely into a full-on Karen tizzy. I mean, I, I didn't blame her. That It was such... Such such a poor time, or such so poorly timed to have. No, it was a timeout that waved that basket off. I can't remember. No, it was like, it. yeah, it was either a timeout or a foul because the Lady Vols had turned it over and were about to get a transition bucket, and then it was stopped. I'm pretty sure it was a, a timeout that was called right before the bat, the bucket went in. Well, I think, it, I think it's time. Kelly Harper? Yes. My stance was if... I felt so bad for her. You're Tennessee, and the standard at Tennessee is national championships. It's the standard Pat Summit set. So if that is the standard, you're nowhere close to that right now. After a few years of Kelly Harper, you're nowhere close. No. So if you're because they they had zero, they weren't even expected to be in the tournament this year preseason. They they played well in the SEC tournament. Should have beat South Carolina. A late game meltdown leads to the buzzer beater three. So. If you bring back Kelly Harper and you love Kelly Harper, fine. But I'm sorry, you don't really get to say that that's the standard because the standard's not even close to being met after a few years of the Kelly Harper era. So it's a, it's a tough situation. They just got to go get someone that can win. Just someone I can't that tell can... you how much I identify with all of the things that you're talking about right <laughs> so now. It, it, really, it's just no, that no. simple. Just fire some, fire them, and go get somebody that can the, win. Please, the parallels God. are there. The parallels are there. No, Mike, I know. Mike Listen. Woodson, Indiana, right? Keep it in the family. The Bob Knight connections. <sighs> Same with Kelly Harper and Pat Summit. It is time for the Lady Vols. I could hear a Carol Lawson with the job she's done at Duke, and she still has that connection as a big name. Mm. But apart from that. Like, Kentucky women's basketball just went and got Virginia Tech's head coach who took them to a Final Four. Yeah. Go get somebody that has won at a high level, regardless of what connection they may or may not have. Vanderbilt's coach has been kicking ass. Yeah, absolutely. Shea Ralph got him in. Uh, Mark Byington introduced this afternoon, yeah. 4 p.m. Did we? Uh, are we going to talk to him at any time? I reached out. I reached out. So, waiting to hear back. What, and- Van- Vandy, <laughs> listen. Vanderbilt, if you're within the sound of my voice, okay? Anybody within that athletic department, if we are trying to seek out a reason to talk about your athletic uh, programs, please do not make it harder for us to do that. If we want to talk to the basketball coach, somebody email Lucas back and let us talk to the basketball coach because I don't know how many opportunities I'm going to get to show you love. Vanderbilt, please. And the Preds looking to make it 19-game point streak tonight in Arizona. 9 p.m. Are you still going on Tuesday? Working on it. <laughs> You're such Lucas, a scumbag. At Lucas Panzeca. <laughs> <laughs> you got any, got any tickets? I will sit anywhere. See, I don't, I don't out loud ask as often as you do. People are just very kind and they DM me uh, privately. Oh, me. sure. Yeah, you've never, you've never uh, tried to. Taylor Swift to is different. Stuff. 
Taylor Swift is different. If I don't pander out loud and I still I wasn't successful, if it makes you feel any better, that's the only time that I've been willing to get in front of a microphone and say, please, somebody give me something for free. Hit me up. Polls. Not now, Jenny. I'm on the radio. Buck Rising gave me a job. Said something about a poll update. Hope that wasn't at that club where you became a folk singer. Anyway, Buck Rising's producer and correspondent has the final poll update. I'm not a smart man, but I know who Lucas Panzeca is. Presented by Two Rivers Ford, the South's most trusted Ford dealer. Does the Calvin Ridley deal make you feel better about not keeping Danico Autry and Aziz Alshayer? 71% say yes. Are you just ignoring me when I'm talking to you in the talk back, or can you you actually not hear me? Uh, I didn't hear I didn't hear anything. I've been trying to talk to you for an hour and a half while we're on the air in the talk back, and the talk back's not working. I guess not. All right, send an email. <laughs> what were you trying to say? That, all manner of things that I can't say on the air, Lucas. <laughs> Name a bigger fall guy than Shohei Otani's translator. Oh, good one from David. Donnie Tyndall. <laughs> Donnie Tyndall fell on the sword for Tennessee basketball, and it is the reason that Tennessee is in the position it is in today with Rick oh, Barnes. Oh, Donnie. Uh, Karen says Connor Stallions, Michigan. No, Connor Stallions wasn't a fall guy. Ah. Uh, what is the best matchup? Uh, no, the assistant coach that was fired, the linebackers coach. That's the fall yeah, guy. Yeah, the fall guy. That's the fall guy. What is the what best? What was A-Rod's guy's name? The guy that went to remember. jail for A-Rod during the steroid investigation. We had Tim Kirchin running through parking lots, chasing down Alex Rodriguez, trying to get a microphone in front of him. What is the best matchup of the Sweet 16? Karen says Duke and Houston. Uh, Duke and Houston. That's oh, Duke right. does play Houston. We we glossed over Duke's game. That's a great game. <laughs> Duke and Houston. Jay Knight I says love Duke. Uh, the Vols and Creighton. I like Alabama, North Carolina, personally. I think that has the most opportunity for weirdness. Um, but I don't know what version of Alabama is going to show up when the defense has been optional all season long. What percentage of the Titans roster is fixed? Brian says 70. That feels high. Karen says 75. Kenneth says 65 to 70 on paper. Tim says 67.48. I'm going to say half. 50%. What percentage of Ross or of uh, starters? Oh, more than that. Yeah. It's definitely that percentage is high. I would I would say probably seventy five percent of starters. Yeah, where it's tackles, inside linebacker, uh edge rusher, safety. And safety. And yeah. a defensive lineman, maybe. But depth is the big. So all of it. The, yeah, that's a, we listed off a few things. <laughs> hey, special teams is checked off. Keep it moving. Special teams is checked Keep off. Keep it moving. Uh that's it. We're done moving. Those yeah. are the polls. Okay, very good. That's the show. We appreciate you guys hanging out with us. Go check out the latest episode of The Install. We spoke on Legereus Sneed. We did not do the deep dive on Legereus Sneed yet because you'll have to get tickets to the live show on May the 3rd at the Hutton Hotel to hear Greg Cosell break down. Legereus Sneed, Calvin Ridley, all the Titans free agents, their upcoming draft class for you and a cast of hundreds because this thing is going to be sold out and we're excited about it. 1045thezone.com to get your tickets. If you want to catch the latest episode of the install, though, it's up on the Zone's YouTube channel. Uh, make sure you subscribe to the Zone's YouTube channel while you're there. Have a great rest of your evening. I will talk to you tonight on A to Z Sports Primetime.